Welcome to another home safari here at the Cincinnati Zoo Botanical Gardens. My name is Dana. I'm one of the keepers that takes care of the African guinea dogs. Um, I put in some femur bones inside that ball so I have to kind of work for it. Um, it's good enrichment for them and makes them work together. Um, it's one of their favorite things, are bones. So that's what they're doing right now. We currently have 11 dogs. Um, about a year ago now it's been, we took in 10 yearlings and mama dog um, from the Endangered Wolf Center. And there are five boys and five girls, all with random names, sort of. Um, these guys were named via donations. So um, the one that's walking, carrying the bone with all the white who just kind of laid down, that's Coda. He's one of our boys. This little lady up front right here, that's Lala. Somebody's screaming. <laughs> Uh, this one with the white collar on your right is Rosie. And then following her with the white patch on her rump is Charlie. Another girl. So three three ladies hanging out. Oh, Charlie's going to go bug somebody. Uh, Mama Dog's in the back along by the stream in the grass. Her name's Akili. Uh, if you're familiar with the dogs that we've had here since this exhibit opened, you might remember Amara, our original female. She is actually related to Achille, or was. Um, Achille is her sister from a different litter, so it's kind of nice that we have a connection to her uh, that came back. Um, who else is there? The more like kind of tan dog with the tan ring and black on his tail who just turned and is walking to the right, that's Amani. He's one of our boys. He's our smallest guy. Let me see. Steven is over. Oh, he's just carrying a bone this way along the stream. Uh, he just, well, he was gonna lay down. Oh, there he goes. That's Steven. He's a very handsome fella. And then we have Duke who has a lot of black. Um, and then another male that we have is Tico. And Tico is actually named after a friend of mine and one of the top dog researchers in the world. Um, I'm a little biased, but he founded Botswana Predator Conservation Trust with his wife, Leslie. And actually they're quarantined in Botswana right now, but he founded the longest running wild dog project in the world, essentially at this point. Um, oh, here comes mama, that's Akili. She's a really good girl, um, and she actually reminds me a lot of Amara, which is uh, uncanny in a way. And she kind of looks like her too, has a lot of the white on her. Um, it's nice that kids aren't bugging her and letting her actually have a bone. But yeah, these guys are the only canid that's a true carnivore. Um, and they are the second most endangered carnivore in Africa after the Ethiopian wolf. There's only between three and 5,000 left in the wild. Um, so they are in trouble. They're coming back in some areas, uh, but persecution uh, from farmers and ranchers is still a problem. Uh, they're kind of treated the same way wolves out west in the US are treated, whereas they're considered a pest species almost. The farmers fear that they take their cattle and goats. Um, and then obviously habitat fragmentation and habitat loss. Uh, lions are kind of a big problem for these guys. Lions account for about 60% of all painted dog deaths from what I've read. Um, and disease. So these guys being in Canada are susceptible to the same diseases that your domestic dog at home is. So they are vaccinated for lepto, rabies, distemper. Um, and then most of these guys are actually trained. We got them trained, it took a couple months, but for voluntary blood draw, which was very exciting. They're kind of difficult to train because we don't separate, um, but we use a, a chute, which is just a smaller space. So they're still together, but kind of separate so that we're able to safely get blood from their back leg vein. Um, and we actually participated in a study uh, in Africa for distemper, which is nice. So we took blood so that labs could test the titers and see how effective the vaccines are and if they can make 
a vaccine that will last longer so that dogs in the wild can be vaccinated and it won't have to be as often. You ready for some questions? Sure, shoot me some questions. Cassidy wants to know what is their favorite food? Their favorite food is, well, right now it's femur bones, um, <laughs> but normally they really do like rabbits, um, guinea pigs. They like big bones, like horse neck bones, oxtail, um, anything like that. But prey items and big carcass feeds are their favorite thing. Ryan wants to know how many usually live together in a pack? Uh, the average varies. I've seen in books where it's 10 dogs is the average or 20 dogs seems to be um, more common. Uh, these guys, the females leave first generally, which is different than other social canids. Um, but yeah, about probably 20, I would say is the average, 10 to 20. Megan asked if they're endangered. Yes, they are endangered. Um, and actually, statistically, a hundred years ago, there were half a million of these guys. So they went from a half a million to three to five thousand in a hundred years. James asked, where are they from in the wild? These guys are from Africa, um, Sub-Sahara Africa. Some of the countries that have larger numbers are South Africa, Botswana, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Kenya. That's all I can think of right now. Megan asked about the squealing sounds. Is that coming from the dogs? Yes, the squealing is part of their vocalization repertoire. Um, it's usually excitement or with these guys a lot of times it's kind of a begging or whining behavior because one of the dogs has something the other wants. Is there a hierarchy to their pack? Yes, so dogs are extremely um, socially complex. And what I have found in my experience is that there is a hierarchy within the entire pack and then within the different sexes. So the males have a hierarchy and the females have a hierarchy. Um, these guys are still kind of in flux. My males have a pretty uh, solid hierarchy the females, it depends on the day, um, and that's just part of the growing uh, pains of a group of guys like this. Um, they're about a year and a half old, so they're still learning the ways. Mom ultimately has the power, but I have found, especially with single females, that they only step in when absolutely necessary. Otherwise, normally you'd have an alpha pair, um, which is usually the parents, and they are firmly in charge, especially dogs in the wild. Those guys are in charge and run in the show. Gianna wants to know, can you pet them? No, <laughs> um, only once. No, uh, these guys now, they are desensitized to touch for certain behaviors, um, but we do not go in with them. I do not pet them. I do not treat them like my dog at home. They are an apex predator. Uh, and actually, they have the strongest bite out of any carnivore in Africa per their body size. Um, I've seen these guys tear metal. <laughs> not here, not, <laughs> not these dogs specifically, but um, they're very good at what they do. They have specialized teeth for shearing meat off bones and they have to have strong jaws for that. So I like my fingers. <laughs> Liam asks, are these also called African wild dogs? Are they the same species? Yes, so yes. It's been more recently that we've more consistently called them African painted dogs. Um, their scientific name, Lycan Pictus, is actually translates to painted wolf-like. Uh, so it's more fitting, I suppose, but you know, people still call them African wild dogs. Cape hunting dogs is another name that they've had in the past. Um, part of it was uh, changing the wild to painted was also to uh, differentiate between feral dogs and wild dogs. Um, people were thinking they meant the same thing instead of, you know, it's an actual species that is in trouble. 
Elizabeth wants to know, do they ever play with toys? They do play with toys. Again, maybe not like your dog at home. Um, if I spray certain perfumes or put spices on either like boomer balls or barrels, uh, they'll play with those. They really like skin so soft. So if I spray <laughs> that on, uh, we have like these jolly eggs that roll around. Um, they love to rub on that stuff. And so they'll push them around and play with them. And if it's something they can carry, they'll cater, carry it around. Um, but honestly, sticks are one of their favorite things. So they're not picky. Dylan wants to know, have they ever caught any of the birds in the yard? I have not seen them catch any of the birds. Diego wants to know, um, what's their lifespan? How long can they live? So their lifespan um, in captivity is about 12 years. We've had dogs live to 14 or 15 in captivity. Um, in the wild, it's about 10. Um, it seems like if you make it to 10, you've had a good long life in Africa. Connor asks, is there soft or is it coarse? It's coarse. It's wiry, um, sort of like a terrier. Um, there are spots that are softer, but it's mostly, yeah, just like wiry. Logan wanted to know, are they related to hyenas? They are not related to hyena. Hyena are actually related to mongoose. Um, these guys are a canid and actually they're their own branch, their own entity. Uh, they're not closely related to any other canid species, so you'd have to go back more than, I think it's like three million years maybe, uh, to find a species of wolf that they were related to. Kaylin wanted to know how many babies are in a litter? <sighs> Again, the average is like six to ten. Um, it just depends. Um, in the wild, it varies as well. Um, there's been litters recorded as high as 19, but you have to keep in mind, um, these guys only have about a 50% chance of making it past a year old. So even though they may have 19 babies, generally only half will make it to uh, their first birthday. Well, that goes right into Chloe's question about do they have predators? Yes, um, in the sense that it's not a predator who's gonna kill and eat them. Um, unfortunately, lions like to kill these guys for fun. Um, they're a competitor for resources, and so lions will try to actually eliminate them. They'll try to find where the dens are if there are pups. Um, but the dogs are actually really good and resourceful. They will uh, kind of already have a plan for their next den site. So if there are lions in the area, they're grabbing pups and taking them. They're moving them out of there. Um, and then hyena kind of are, they're not, again, a predator. It's more of a competition thing. Um, hyena will try to steal their food. And if there's enough dogs, they'll try to guard it and protect it. You know, but there's, a, there's only a couple dogs. Hyena are very large and very strong. Uh, so the dogs usually will just give up at that point and walk away. Oh yeah. I have um, some paper mache I'm gonna throw in for these guys. They like tearing stuff up, so you'll get to see some natural behavior. Ellery wants to know why are their ears so big? Their ears are very large for a couple of reasons. Um, obviously, they need to be able to hear well. Um, that was Ada who just threw that over her head. That was pretty fantastic. I don't want this one. Um, so they need to hear. Uh, they do travel long distances. Uh, so if they do get overheated, it does help with uh, cooling the body down. Um, it is my understanding that 
it does not work like an elephant ear. So it's not that the ear surface area releases heat. It's actually that if they're running along or whatever, the air is funneled into the ear canal, um, which cools that area down, which cools the uh, skull down, which cools the brain down, which tells the brain to cool the body down. And they also use them to vocal or to uh, communicate too. Sorry, yes. Uh, Riley wanted to know if they can swim. Riley, they can swim. Uh, it, now again, this is not something they may do it in the wild. I, I can't imagine why. Um, maybe to cross to get to other areas, but I know generally they stay to shallow areas uh, because anything deeper is crocodile and hippo territory. But here in captivity, since we don't have those threats, until they're about a year old, uh, the pups will swim in our moats, which are empty right now. I've never seen the adults swim. Um, they'll get in the shallow stream parts and like lay down to get cool and get out. But the pups, when they're young, are the only ones that I've seen actually swim. Um, but they are capable of it, and it's pretty funny to watch. There's videos online that you can see from here. Uh, of them swimming, and it's just their little heads and ears above the water. Evan wants to know, do they ever bark like a dog? Um, I, I would say it's similar. I wouldn't say it's, you know, the same. Um, these guys have a pretty wide range of vocalizations. It's more of kind of like a low guttural growl that's uh, short. Um, but I don't know that I would consider it a bark per se, um, but they do make all sorts of fun noises and it's, all of them mean different things. Um, noise, some you hear all the time and some are only in extreme situations, say a fight or um, females will who call when they're ready to give birth or if a dog passes away or leaves the pack, um, yeah. All right, our last question is from Beth, and she wanted to know, does their co their colored coat act as camouflage? Yeah, uh, believe it or not, you think it wouldn't, but I did find um, when I was really, you know, lucky enough to go to Botswana, um, they blend in really well. I didn't think they would. Um, I thought it'd be pretty obvious where the dogs were, and it nope, it took a lot to find where they were. Um, and that time of year that I went, the Mopani was growing um, in, full, in full bloom or whatever, and uh, they blended in perfectly with that. So even though it's a lot of bright white, um, they're hard to see. And don't forget, you guys, uh, there's a link at the bottom of this for an activity that you can do at home. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk and the painted dogs. They're the best.